I'll give a 9-11 story because everyone knows it's 9-11 now. And everyone also knows that because of great leaps for the last 25 years, I've pretty well traveled the country. Uh, one of the things I've always liked to do, and I want everybody here to know this, is once this stupid virus allows us, allows me especially to travel again, I like to go to the places other people do not go to. Uh, like one of my favorite places I, I was ever at was Public School 96 in Spanish Harlem. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of town now. Uh, this is a South Florida. It's not in France. <laughs> yeah, I was in Paris, Kentucky, <laughs> uh, Appalachia. Uh, I, I've been to some neat places. And I like to go to the places where uh, not on that mainstream path where I can meet real kids, real teachers, real mm -hmm. problem areas not just going to the neatest places like public school 96 in Spanish Harlem, wonderful people. And a mockery is what I was trying to come up with a migrant labor town in South Florida. I went to a mockery high school, interesting stuff there. Another day to talk about the friend, absolutely the friendliest school I've ever been at in my life. The student, it was the students who welcomed me there. Uh, and and I just I just love these small places. I've been through Appalachia. I've been through the Bronx, Spanish Harlem. Uh, uh, seeing all them, and of course I've been to you know all the conference sites, Denver, Manhattan, all of that stuff. But one of the greatest things about being a teacher is meeting other teachers from all around. And and it, and nine eleven, what brings it to me is what a wonderful country we're in what wonderful teachers I've met, what wonderful stories I've gotten from real, real people. Conferences, you know, there's 300 people, we're all dressed nice, wearing our ties, and we're so polite, but it's not the same as being, you know, in real live frontline places. Both are great, but seeing, uh, seeing real world places and what they're doing and how children's lives are changing. And now I'm focusing in on to a theme of what I want to talk to about today. And, and, and that is generalization and boy, that, that word, let's get off. We've got to use the word, but uh, parents don't need to hear it. They don't know what it means. We need to, this goes back to Patrick McGreevy and my training. We need to speak to parents in the world in real English that they understand. My job's not to show off that I've got a degree. My job's not to show off that I know a lot of stuff. My job's to communicate in real language. So a word like generalization doesn't mean anything. So we've got to get that in our own talk because it may be the cornerstone of our objectives in everything we do as teachers, tutors, instructors is aiming at generalization. That means outside of my artificial environment, my contrived environment, my work with those students takes on relevant meaning. That's huge. We're not doing it. We must. Let's get back to the basics here. The cornerstone, the student. What does, this is two weeks ago, what does that child need? I'll tell you, they don't need to pass a wide variety of end of the year tests in their real life. They may need it soon, but their real need step at a time is to take the skills we give them and use them. Generalization, it needs to move beyond me. I was a behavior disorders teacher. I had the <laughs> toughest, meanest, mo wow. <laughs> Many of my colleagues always felt kind of good that uh, if they were out for a day or two, all hell broke loose. And they felt that that was a good sign that I'm needed. <laughs> it's not about me. It's not about me, it's about them. I felt successful if I was out 
and I come back that there were no problems. So with, with great leaps, the similarity, I guess, or yes. the, that you draw is if they're only having success, of course, within the confines of this program and with the the one-on-one -on -one environment, then ultimately that's not the success that we're looking for. Um, completely contrived and not real. Completely contrived and not real. We have many programs out there that I won't tell you their names. In my opinion, completely contrived and not real to the needs of a child. Do you have a minute for a phone call I did today that deals with that? Well, let me, I guess, real quick before you get to that, I just wanted <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to tell the uh, kind of my generalization story with um, oh, Linda? Uh, working, yeah, working with my niece, yeah. Linda. Um, so we found out, you know, that she had a reading problem when playing Monopoly with her. Uh, and, and my other niece is at home, you know, she's doing a lot of avoidance behavior. So um, I started on Great Leaps with her uh, a few years ago now. Um, and, you know, she was very behind as a fourth grader. She's reading at the first grade level, pretty much started her at the beginning of the program. Um, and, you know, of course, in her own classwork, she was in the, you know, behind, she was in the, uh, okay. the reading. Okay. So she was in the, um, the uh, lower last. <laughs> last kind of, you know, reading uh, group of, of her class in her small private school. And, you know, after a year, year and a half of working with her, um, I asked her in a depth of knowledge question, what's something that you're proud of? Uh, and she told me my reading and I said, yes. you know, first of all, as an uncle, that's so touching. But then, you know, I just said, well, why is that? And she goes, well, I just got moved up into uh, the regular reading class with everybody else. And, um, you know, while, while I knew from, from seeing her date in great leaps, I knew she's, you know, still a little bit behind from where she needed to be. She's clearly performing well enough in her class and, and with her peers that, you know, they felt that it was right to bring her, um, to bring her up with, with everybody else. So, uh, and then from that to to reading chap her first chapter books yeah. and everything, you could see how it was affecting her real world in her class and you know with uh, you know just her whole view of of reading. That that huge piece when she said, "Me, what makes me proud," and she picked reading. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Uh, she was she was behind. I mean, she and, and she has a way above average IQ. There was, oh, it, it angers me that kids so bright can't read. I'll I'll go to Ken. I you'll hear me quote Ken Pugh a lot from Yale. I like him when he says ninety seven percent of our children can learn how to read. He was not inferring at, with a lot of contrivances. That's like formal interventions. That's like all the cool stuff we can do. He's saying our children can learn how to read. And I've again got to take this back to my mother. She taught me to read. She didn't go to college anywhere. She didn't have a method. She had love. She had consistence and persistence and love. We, we've learned a lot in how to teach reading. We have learned a lot in how to teach reading. So we can do better than my mom. I don't think we can give more love, but we can get better. And this is what it's all about. It's not about me. This isn't the Campbell reading program. It's great leaps because I'll define great leaps now, because that's a generalization. Our whole world, our whole, my world of reading goes to generalization all the time, because if you're, it doesn't generalize, you're wasting your time. We don't have time to waste. But great leaps from Ogden Lindsley is that point where they've worked with me long enough, where they trust me. I have eliminated the entire punishment laden system of reading for these kids. I've eliminated the punishers and shown successes. But successes they see. I don't know how many 16 year old kids out there could give a flip if they can now I determined step 64A in phonics and they got a goal on it. I don't think anybody cares. But uh, when you suddenly pass that test, when 
when suddenly you read something and it's funny. Uh, there, when it generalizes, this is what it's all about. And we've got to focus on that and demand. Each one of us here needs to demand this in the systems we work with and who we work with. If it doesn't generalize, you're wasting your damn time. Hear me, hear me loud. It's not relevant if it doesn't generalize. If you can't use it, if it's not relevant, here we go again, back to two weeks ago, the needs of the child, the need in reading is for it to generalize. You're not here just to make me feel good. The need in reading is for it to generalize. It needs to show up amongst their peers. It needs to show up in their self-esteem. It needs to show up in their free time. It needs to show up when we see the joy of reading show up in a kid that used to hate it. We made the great leap and we'll get there soon. Now we can do anything. When my kids had finished the great leaps, stories in my own classroom i sent them to the library go get the hardest book you can find i mean the hardest and we're going to pick our next probe again that's jargon we're going to pick our next story i'm going to type it and we're going to have a probe on that and make it hard i don't want to see any of these skinny little books <laughs> i want a hard one so uh, I've I've done War and Peace, <laughs> I've done Geta, <laughs> I've done the craziest books, and I send those books with homework. I want you to take that book home and study. <laughs> and all I'm doing that for is one simple reason: they're not carrying a baby book home on the book on the bus. They're bringing home Geta's Faust. <laughs> like, oh. So, Dad, I want to bring up the uh, the point that you had here about mentioning the differentiating between kind of skill building for word recognition and things oh. like that and making that transition to reading and Eileen oh. Marzola's work. Eileen, Eileen is so neat on this. Uh, she's an Orton Gillingham person, probably one of the best tutors in, in, in the world. Uh, huge, incredibly successful and one of the brightest people I've ever had the knowledge of meeting. She saw very early, she's very Orton Gillingham oriented she saw very early that with her students at Hunter College, her students at Columbia College, her students uh, at the Hunter College School, and dis her dyslexic students could figure out any word in the world. These are world-class teachers. Figure out any word, word in the world, but none of them were reading. It was too slow. It was laborious. It was robotic. They couldn't read. So she was looking and she, 20, 20, over 20 some years ago now, heard Cecil Mercer, one of my mentors that became a friend, speaking in Chicago at a Learning Disabilities Association conference I couldn't afford to go to about my work, about some cool stuff that was happening with my work. She heard him because what she needed was the bridge I need the bridge between word knowledge and word recognition and the ability to read words. I need reading. Good, Eileen, you got it. We're not here teaching skills. We're not here buying tools for the toolbox. We're building birdhouses and from that, we're gonna build real, real houses. She saw that need and tried it, got success. And before I know it, uh, I virtually had to leave school systems because of uh, I had my own business and I'm an accidental entrepreneur. But Eileen, one of the, again, one of the brightest people I know, I hope you get to meet her. She saw that what we were doing in all these programs for dyslexic children was just filling their toolbox. It wasn't building things, but relevance is building things. And, and early, and I've got to work on this. I got labeled a fluence. My work got labeled a fluency program. Well, if people knew the definition of fluency, it'd matter. Fluency is, is, re, is reading and understanding with, with correct speed, intonation, but reading and understanding. Well, that's, most people hear fluency and they hear, oh, you're for speed. I see that timer you've got. You just want speed. 
Well, that's garbage because I've slowed kids down before. You know, I've told kids, slow down so you'll speed up because they're in such a hurry. They're making mistakes. They don't have to. So it isn't about, it is about speed, but it isn't about faster speed. <laughs> it's about relevant speed. It's about speed that matters so you can read and make sense out of it. So the kid reading too fast needs to be slowed down. That's rare in our world, but they're there. And the kid that's reading too slow, we need to do fluency, speed building exercises. But if you can't, now we use every, we put things together. And that's what makes Great Leaps very, very different. We're putting things together so it can be utilized in the real world, world and that means generalized. And so on, in addition to that, um, the kind of distinction between generalizing to the test as in like, you know, as educators, sometimes there's that expectation and, and an over-focus on teaching to the test and making sure they can at the end of the year meet <laughs> certain standards versus you know, generalization, generalizing to the to the kids' real real life. You know, well, I'll talk two things about tests. Uh, I don't like I don't like big tests, but I could get I could get a school's test up about ten percent through just motivation. <laughs> that has nothing to do with teaching skills. If I get those kids more motivated on the test than I do a few dirty tricks, uh, dirty tricks that don't mean anything on tests. This will get your score up. Hey, when the teacher coughs three times, it means there's three minutes left in the test, I want you to fill everything that you haven't done with C. Your scores will go up. Uh, has nothing to do with teaching. Another thing, somebody says, ha ha, they'll be on to you. Next year, try that. I said, ha, I know they're on to me. Next year, everybody, when you hear the teacher cough three times, fill it in with B. <laughs> uh, that's not real. It will get funding for my school and I will do anything to get my kids the help they need. But teaching, I've got to tell a story today because it just happened today and it made me, it, it, it bothers me greatly. A mother spent over $100,000 on her kid in the last four years. Four years, kid's a fifth grader now. A girl entering adolescence, which now I'm getting into children's needs and parent needs. Four years, okay, she's reading at the kindergarten level. Okay, that, that's pretty low for all of that. Uh, what's her rate? 14 words a minute. Okay, now I did a lot of talking to figure out what's causing that 14. And believe me, it's nothing that should cause a 14. In her testing, phonics was mastered. I hope it would be after, uh, after a year of uh, Wilson and a year of Barton and uh, and a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and working with Linda Mood. And now you've got, oh, she's got everything going on. And you're kidding me. Five years in schooling and she's reading 14 words a minute. I can get a parrot reading 14 words a minute. I think you give me a, you give me a hundred thousand bucks. I'm Scottish, but come on 14 words a minute. That's worthless. What's her goal. She's, she has an IEP and this is a lawyer. I'm talking to her. What's her goal. Uh, her Mother is a lawyer. Yeah, the right. mother is a liar. Yeah, what's what's this little emerging adolescent girl and behavior that means a lot to me? What's her annual goal in reading? Nineteen words a minute. Uh, I'm in shock. So goal nineteen words a minute. Go have her go play tennis. She loves tennis. Use something valuable to her. Nineteen words a minute is not valuable at all. Not at fifth grade. She's getting ready to go into middle school. We got to get on it. Uh, her testing. First of all, on testing, I try not to read a kid's test before I work with a kid. I want to know them for a week before I read what somebody else thought so I know what I think. And uh, this girl's testing comes out. She's mastered phonics. Well, I hope so. 100,000 bucks. I was surprised she's mastered sight words. Interesting. She has. Phonological awareness. Wow. How can you be so low? That that's a that, that's some more conversations. But I want to see this girl reading. And I told her, I hope and I'll work with you. This isn't, and I don't charge by the hour for this kind of stuff. This is free phone call fun stuff. Uh I want this girl in three months of great leaps to be reading at 45 words a minute. What would you think if that happened? She'd think it's a miracle. That ain't a miracle. 45 words a minute. 
for a fifth grader, it just means uh, we're knocking the wall down. Here's my goal for her in two years. If this is if this is possible, sometimes it isn't because of brain damage. If this is possible, my goal for her at the end of sixth grade is reading 140 words a minute with less than 5% errors at the fifth grade level. That's a goal. That's an objective. That's something this girl needs. The second thing, I want us to think whole child. Not only do I want the generalization of her being able to do this skill in isolation on a test, I want it being fun, eliminate punishers. I want her feeling better about herself. I, I heard she hates reading. She looks away from it. She rolls her eyes. She doesn't want to do this stuff. All behavior, all stuff through the elimination of punishment and making sure you get relevant reward. You suddenly, you get another generalization. They move from hating reading to enjoying their time in great leaps. And then that's still all artificial and contrived. And then to going to the book fair, picking out a book and reading it in the car while mom is shopping, choosing reading so, over shopping. That so how real matters. quick, yeah, I was, I was gonna ask real quick and then I, I think Lisa can, can provide some more details on that story that happened with Devante, but um, before that, real quick, how do you kind of maybe go about making that transition or helping encourage that transition behaviorally of, you know, enjoying reading in your work in Great Leaps to the outside world? Is there anything you do to encourage that? Now I'll go back to your original question, which, uh, like a good politician, I didn't answer. I didn't want to, <laughs> meant to, but didn't. How do you move from that phonic stuff into relaxing and sitting back on the sofa and reading a chapter book. How do you get there? You're not going to get there through phonics. I love phonics. We're a phonetic language. You're not going to get there through phonics. You're not going to get there through skills and isolation. You're just not going to do it. And there's a whole history of kids not doing it. You may luck up because the kid just ends up breaking the code and doing it. But in our world, we're working with more difficult children than that. So we don't just do phonics and variations of that theme. Half of our words are high frequency words. They're calling them sight words, but that definition of sight words is starting to change. So I want to go over to high frequency words. These words show up a lot, if them, there, those words. But 50%, 40 to 60% of our words on any given passage are those words. And working with children, and with their reading daily in my own classroom, I saw, man, it only takes me one time to teach pterodactyl. They get that word quick. Man, it doesn't follow any rules at all, in my opinion, that they've been taught. Pterodactyl, oh, they know it's a flying dinosaur that'll bite your head off. And they like it. They get it. I was having trouble with, oh, bam, these. In fact, in, in the analysis of Great Leaps, we ran through the computer, the three words are missing the most besides the ones that show up the most. That means A and I. I'm not going to do a whole lot of work to teach them <laughs> the words A and I are there and were and three. And when I saw that, I, I'm, I'm elated because that's one of that's my favorite three word <laughs> high frequency. So we've got to nail down not through intricacies that take two years. We've got to get, we've got to nail down high frequency words. So the errors in high frequency words are eliminated. I don't care if you can orthographically map them all. I just don't. And so does eliminating, does eliminating those errors, I guess, lead, lead them to reducing frustration and then kind of open up that the world, I guess, of, of being well, able to read books or stories for yeah. pleasure. Not yet. The third element, story reading, a gradated step, step by step. I've got to take them where they're at, instructionally, make it easy, ensure a group of successes, and move them so they can independently read at a much higher level. Once you get that, other behaviors open up because these children are in the real world. 
And I, I gave the Devante story about reading the book on astronomy. I'll give you another fast one on generalization. This is Aiken, South Carolina, ninth grade boys reading at the first, second grade level, labeled learning disabled. And I do not, I think it was an inappropriate label. I hate labeling children. Two ninth grade boys on the football team labeled learning disabled, reading at fir high first, early second grade level. Great leaps in the library. The coach, football coach, would not let them practice or play until, unless they came in with a pass from the librarian that they'd done their great leaps. Then they could practice. He would not let them play because they couldn't read. And boy, they wanted to play because in Aiken, South Carolina, it appears Aiken High School, it's all about being cool and being on the football team so they could dress out if they brought the pass. So at the end of the ninth grade, both boys were tested with the star test. Not a great test, but it's what they had. And both boys mastered the fourth grade reading level. Coach said, great, you're on the team. Uh, you can play in practice. You don't have to do anything. Summer came. No summer school. No special ed. No anything. They played football. They had a typical Aiken, South Carolina, child of poverty summer. But something was going on because when they tested them in the ninth grade, 10th grade, start of 10th grade, new star testing, both boys scored like 7.5 to 8. Where in the hell did you just get three years of reading growth with no instruction? Zero school instruction. How do you grow like that? The answer is great. I like sports. Both boys read the sports page. Once you get independent reading, the environment can take over and generalize growth even. That is so cool. That's the power of generalization. Now we need to motivate, if we get them to the finish line of Great Leaps, we've got to motivate them to learn how to, re to keep reading. And you do that through relevance. We could have put the we could have put these children all these two boys all we wanted to on on reading about uh, the history of New Hampshire. <laughs> Fat chance they're going anywhere. They don't care. They cared about sports. They translated the skill we gave them in a contrived environment into a real environment, and that's generalization. That's what it's all about, and I mean all about. Those boys can read now, and they can read stories to their children now. We did it. Yeah. And it took not only that librarian at Great Leaps. You know the critical guy in all of this picture? The coach. Football coach. The coach is the critical. We, we work as teams with children, parents, coaches, teams, in the love of that child. And our job as teachers looking at the final picture and the final picture is not my paycheck i'm a teacher my final picture is seeing that child cross the finish line even this is so cool even when it's not me it's when lisa's kid i hope you go look on our website and look at was well, rather than looking i was going to say yeah. since lisa's here lisa if you want to jump on real quick and and just speak to that story of generalization then we'll open it up to if anybody else yeah. has any stories kind of that they'd like to share we'd love to hear it that's what we like the real hi guys the really cool thing generalization once they get the confidence and they understand that reading doesn't have to be punishing and drudgery and miserable they want to read one of the things i do with the great leaves program working at even at a distance is the kids take pictures of the probes and when they get the leap not before when they get the leap they, their parents or they could take pictures of those exercises and glue them into a composition book. They could read those exercises to the world. And that gets them loving what they're doing rather than it being a drudgery. Devante is a really cool story with that. You guys probably all see in the video of him so frustrated that he's, he's beating himself with the head and, and screaming that he can't do it. Well, that kid, I got a call from his mom about nine months into the program, and she's like, you're never gonna believe what Devante's doing. He went to, he had a book fair at school like those like schools are known to do. His mama sent him with some money, 
and he came back with a book on astronomy and he was so excited. Well, his mom pulls up at the grocery store and she's like, come on. And he's like, no, you go. I want to stay here reading. And he drove all the way to the store with the book in the car, telling his mom stuff about what he, did you know? And did you know? Hit her up with stuff when she got back. And that's, that's the power. The power is in when I have a high school kid, Nick, who at 16 and a half couldn't even read it, can't even read a menu at a restaurant. Like legit low in his reading. And for the first time a few weeks ago, this is eight and a half months in, he was able to, for the first time, read the error thing on the Great Leaps program. He was able to tell me instead of having, can you imagine at 16 and a half, having to go to his mom and hand her the tablet when he has a problem logging in? That's real world, real world generalization. And that if he were only doing phonics, that wouldn't happen yet. He's really, it's taken him a while with phonics. We've got to get out there in this real world and let our story be known in behavior. That uh, I, I read on one of the big sites, I won't name it because I don't wanna defame it, <laughs> but a 17 year old, it was, a 17 year old reading at the second grade level on this site, they were asking for advice. This is a Facebook group, I think to it, clarify. It's, it is but... a Facebook group. And and uh, I try not to write on it because I don't like getting kicked off. Uh, this is a Facebook group talking about a high schooler who cannot read. And the advice I read First of all, I, I insinuated that this was an inner city kind of kid of poverty. I also insinuated he probably went to a, uh, a school that didn't offer every service in the world, especially if you've been in school for 18 years and you're only reading at the second grade level. Uh, and I, I also insinuated he had the capacity to learn how to read because most of our children do. But the advice I read was so distressing that we as educators, as, especially as behavioral educators, we have to get this word out. That boy does not need a plethora of expensive tests. He can't read, he's a second, let me work with him. Let me hear him. Let me get to know him. And let me see if I need a bunch of tests. Let me see what performance, let his performance start dictating what I do, but what they were recommending, somebody's never been in a real life classroom of 17 year olds and 16 year olds, because they're recommending this boy sit in a class, a remedial class where, oh boy, everybody in the old school knows you're sitting in a remedial class of phonics. You're kidding me. He's 17 years old. He's not gonna do it. He's gonna hate it. Give me 15 minutes a day with him. Give any of you 15 minutes a day with him and you'll see a changed life. Yeah, speak, speaking of that, I did want to, since uh, we're kind of in the last, you know, s several minutes here, um, and I know we got a, a number of good instructors in the room. Yes. Um, did anybody, I guess, want to jump in with any questions or share any stories of their own students, you know, making that leap from it leaves through to the the real world success and we do kind of want to as much as we can make this you know an open conversation yeah. so um well look at I'll, I'll i'll keep going so we don't have just dead sure. time but if i if i see your microphone go off i'm ready i'm ready to go i want to we we, we still got enough time to get this word out in our field. Everyone here is a leader in our field, everyone. We've got to, without denigrating skill building, we've got to get that word out that quite honestly, it is more than skill building. I don't care what program you use, use it. 
you need as an instructor, teacher, community leader to know our job is to get this kid reading. And that's just not the tools. I need him to read. And if your tool doesn't do it, go to <laughs> go to Walmart and buy another tool. Uh, get the child reading. I don't care how you do it. Get that child reading, real reading. And where do you start? Too easy. If it has to be the start, it's the start. All I need is the first success. All I need is the first success to know that I can build and cross that finish line. I've got to get that success. I do not need, I do not have the 10 year old I talked about today. She's entering adolescence. She doesn't have two years of continued failure. She doesn't have two years to feel like she's in the bottom reading group. She doesn't have that amount of time. We have to remediate her. We have to get her performing with her peers with a smile on her face. And if we see her buying that astronomy book, sitting on the sofa laughing at something she's read, that is generalization. That is our objective. We need to focus on that objective. And if we're not getting there, if we see we're not getting there in a timely manner, we need to do something else. We need to talk mm -hmm. to people we know, find experts we know, find out what will work. Listen again to the one, the mother who spent over $100,000. She just, she had just bought another variation on the same thing where she'd spent a ton of money on phonics. She figured it didn't work. And what does she buy? Another phonics tutor. Those are essential skills that is not reading. This girl passed phonics, by the way. She can read. Generalization, fighting for generalization. You measure generalization, in my opinion, without is listening to them read what's expected of them at their age. Lasonia, I saw you unmuted there. Did you uh, yeah. want to jump in with something? Yeah, this is Lasonia. Hi, Ken. I don't see your picture. I see welcome to Harvard. <laughs> You're getting fired, girl. I'm actually, I'm actually in that picture. So if you zoom nice. in, you'll see me. Um, so I have, and I apologize for my tardiness. I was actually um, ending a college meeting um, and didn't end until 4:30, unfortunately. Oh, no worries, no worries. Uh, it's about my tardiness. Ken, I know you, um, and I jumped in at the end, and maybe you discussed this earlier, but I did hear you say, um, "Get the child reading. Get them reading. Start. Get them reading." Yes. And then you also elaborated on just go to Walmart and buy something to get them reading. <laughs> However, you then stated that, okay, they purchased this phonics thing that's clearly oh, not that's yeah. not getting their child to read where they need to be or what is actually reading, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and my bigger piece is to get them literate. Um, yes. So yeah, my, question, my question is if, if, you're encouraging them to go to Walmart and buy some form no. of. No, not I did not at all. That was at the end of a conversation. Okay, okay. I'm saying when everything is else, okay. when everything else has failed. Gotcha. Okay. Hell, go to Walmart. Gotcha. <laughs> That's a joke. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Are, I, I wanted to bring one thing up up to you, Lasagna, because of our, Lasagna and I have worked together in behavior disorders for a long time now. Uh, earlier. In this, I, I quoted Ken Q from uh, Yale as he spoke that 97% or so, maybe it's 96, I'm not detailed, of our children can be taught easily to read. Okay, we're not behaving that way. All right. We are giving them contrived artificial skill building programs that are not working. Our children of poverty, people are really gonna love this one, are the easiest group of kids to teach to read that I've ever run into in my entire life. Why? Because they've not been, I, I'm behavior disorders. My, my children of poverty generally have not been abused. They can't read because the system didn't care. And that's just being blunt. Uh, they've been easy to teach to read. Our problem there would be language and that's another that's another whole talk, but I can get them reading. We, 
we can get them reading and easily. We've got to quit playing these games of contrived, intricately tried interventions that make us as tutors and teachers and professionals look smart. It isn't about us. That was that was two weeks ago. It's not out. It's not about us. It's about them, and we rate progress through the measurement of progress, and that is reading. I agree with you, Ken, on certain levels. I also agree with the fact that we're look when we look at and you know we yeah, you're absolutely right. We work both worked a long time for students with behavior disorders and with students in marginalized populations and under our underserved populations um, and populations in general that are most at risk. Being a byproduct of those all of those populations and knowing um, those cultures um, intricately, as I am a part of those. Um, stereotypes, I I would voice to say that when we look at reading and literacy in general, we really need to come at it from an authentic um, manner where we're looking at not only um, the literacy part of it or the reading portion of it, of what you're specifically looking at, but looking at the whole child as it relates to who they are, their dispositions, where they come from, um, what are they valuing, what are they doing? Are, let's wrap their valuing. Then let's begin with the literacy at those levels. If it's music, if it's art, if it's science, if it's engineering, if it's technical um, things, let's look at it from those levels. So we have, it's really a need to start meeting our students and our some of our parents as well, yes. meeting them where they are at, meeting them where they need to be. But so am I correct yeah. when I move this into one word, relevance? Right, absolutely. And, and we've talked about this a lot earlier and in two weeks ago, especially meeting the needs of the child. And that's the whole child, mm -hmm. not the needs of the system, not, yes. the needs of, not the needs of all that other stuff, okay. meeting the need and focusing on the needs of the child. And then us recognizing as teachers, the need of literacy is incredible. Even if the child doesn't want it at the time. I'm yeah, I want to interject real quick. Lasagna, uh, we will be uploading these to uh, to YouTube, and he, he mentioned, sorry, Lasagna. Lasagna, uh, so, like so, so Lasagna. Lasagna, my bad. Uh, lasagna. Like, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we will be uploading this to YouTube, and he had, he had mentioned you may want to uh, check it out when we do a story of um, uh, two students in the ninth grade who once they'd gotten oh. through the program, improved their own reading through, like you said, what's relevant to their lives. They're reading the sports page um, <laughs> and reading about football, essentially, because that's, you know, their whole motivation behind getting their grades up was to keep playing football. And, you know, he explains it in more detail, but you're, you're absolutely right when you talk about, you know, making it relevant to their own lives and their own worlds. Relevance in, in, in that. And in, here's what we've got to do in reading. We can't get anywhere with our children who ha have failed for so long and they hate reading. We have to eliminate punishers. We have to build up successes, yep. honest, real successes. Not, I said earlier that who they don't care if on page 19 B, they got a goal. They they're in, they're they're in this horrid place for an hour for nothing but phonics in my opinion i say horrid because it bored me to no end uh we have to move for relevance and fun and work within in the whole everything i've worked with working within the attention spans of the child undoing the pun the, the, the horrid what punishment has done to our children who cannot read and and when I honestly said children of poverty or marginalized children, in my opinion, have been the easiest ones to teach to read. That's because it isn't rocket science. It becomes rocket science when the child has been sexually abused. It's rocket science when the child has had a traumatic brain injury. It's rocket science when the dyslexia is so extreme you can see it on an MRI bring in the pros. But if the kid can't read because nobody gave a damn, guess what? I can take a school bus driver and teach that kid how to read. Because my mama taught me how to read. All you got to do is care enough to do it, make it relevant, make it successful, make it fun, stick with the kid to the finish line, 
it'll generalize into yeah. success.